Before I introduce Elsa, I want to tell you a little about the Friends of the Alameda Free Library, a nonprofit organization. Our board and our volunteers raise funds and advocate for the outstanding public library in Alameda. Despite the pandemic, the Friends is committed to, to its role as a library support organization. Our virtual docent and author talks since the shutdown have been very popular and we've had more than 2000 attend. Okay. We also sponsor an online used bookstore offering books and grab bags of books from our alamedafriends.com website with home delivery on the island. New books are added every week, so check out our website. Our Friends at Home events have provided opportunities to connect us and share common experiences. Thanks to our supporters for their ongoing donations so that we can continue to honor our commitments to the library and help support events such as this one tonight. We ask that you consider a donation to the Friends in any amount that is comfortable for you via our website at alamedafriends.com. We are really delighted to welcome this evening Elsa Hart, author of the highly acclaimed Lee Du Mystery novel series set in early 18th century China and her latest mystery set in the same time period, but in England, The Cabinets of Barnaby, Maine, which was recently nominated for the Mary Higgins Clark Award. Elsa has an international background. She was born in Rome and lived and attended international schools in both Moscow and Prague. She graduated from Swarth Swarthmore College in um, Pennsylvania and earned her law degree at Washington University in St. Louis. She's also lived in China in the modern city surrounding Dayan, the old city that is the setting for her first Li Du novel. It will come as no surprise that the characters in her novels are travelers who find themselves in new places and in new circumstances and facing new problems. I am so pleased to introduce Els Hart to you this evening. Thank you so much for inviting me to join you and for that wonderful introduction. Um, I'm so grateful for the warm invitation I received from Karen Manuel and for the help from Karen Romer and David Beale getting everything set up. This is the most organized Zoom event I've attended. So uh, thank you, I'm very appreciative. Um, I hope everyone listening is doing okay tonight. I hope you've been finding your ways to the books and stories that you need right now uh, through whatever challenges you and your loved ones are facing. I know my own reading habits this past year have surprised me a little bit. Some books that I would have thought were perfect for me haven't quite drawn me in, but there are other books that I've had on my shelf for a long time and suddenly right now in this moment, they've kind of called out, now's the time and completely absorbed me. So it's the nice thing about books, they're um, very patient, willing to wait until the perfect time for you to come together. Um, and I'm so thankful that my library here in St. Louis, Missouri, where I live, uh, has curbside pickups and librarians and friends of libraries like you working hard to, to connect readers with books. So as you know, my name is Elsa Hart. I've written four books. The first three are historical mysteries set in China in the early 1700s. And I should say they're very loosely historical. All of the characters in my books are fictional with the exception of a few unavoidable historical realities like queens and emperors. Um, my most recent book also takes place in the early 1700s, but the action, as Karen said, shifts from China to London and to a new detective, a plant enthusiast named Cecily Kay. But today I'm gonna to be talking mostly about my first book, Jade Dragon Mountain, which I understand some of you in the audience have uh, read recently in the context of a book club. And Jade Dragon Mountain, which I have here, <laughs> um, probably backwards on Zoom, I can't tell. Um, it tells the story of Li Du. He is an exiled imperial librarian who is traveling through the borderlands of China and when we meet him, Li Du has embraced his solitude. He has very little interest in human interaction. 
and he he dreads the mandatory check-ins that he has to do with local magistrates. Um, and the one that he has to do at the beginning of the book is particularly unpleasant for two reasons. First, the magistrate happens to be a cousin who is ashamed of having Li Du in the family. And second and much worse, he learns that the emperor who sentenced him to exile is about to visit the town to preside over an eclipse of the sun. So of course, Li Du can't wait to leave, but uh, before he does, he meets and briefly befriends a Jesuit astronomer who's one of the travelers who has come to see this spectacle. And when that Jesuit is murdered, the search for his killer shows Li Du that he isn't quite as finished with the world as he thought he was. So I'll, I'll touch on my other books at the end of my talk and I'm happy to answer questions about them too. Happy to answer questions about anything really. Um, but I will start by telling you the story of how I came to write Jade Dragon Mountain. Uh, it began in the summer of 2010. I had just finished my second year of law school and I wasn't planning to write a book. I was one of those law school students who lived in terror of being called on in class and not being prepared and actually being prepared for every class in law school, at least for me, meant not really having any other plans except for what it took to do that. Uh, but thinking back on it, I, I do think that law school prepared me to write a book, uh, even though I didn't know it at the time. Uh, I didn't know much about law school before I went, but one thing I found out was that it wasn't really so much about learning the laws because the laws you have to know uh, if you become a, a lawyer vary so much depending on the kind of law that you're practicing really a lot of it was about teaching students to think like a lawyer, to approach problems in a certain way. And a big part of that is learning to take this huge in real life sort of infinite number of facts and select the relevant ones and put them in order to tell a persuasive story. And you practice doing that over and over and over. Um, and that it turns out is pretty much like writing a novel. Um, you just have the added work of okay. also making up most I of the facts. I got back on here and I, my camera was on, I got it off. So not only was I not planning on writing a novel then, but I had never really thought about being a writer at all. Uh, I'd always loved stories though. My family, as Karen said, moved around a lot when I was little. And whenever I we were in a new place, my mom would always first thing take us to all the museums. And for every painting that I was drawn to, usually ones of ladies in pretty dresses, <laughs> um, I'd ask my mom, what's the story? And she had this amazing skill of coming up with a story on the spot to match the painting or, or quickly adapting the caption for a you know, three-year-old. Um, but when I, and when I was old enough, I became an avid reader um, and a reader who from the beginning took mysteries very seriously. There is an audio cassette recording of me making an audiobook of Agatha Christie's 13 Problems at around age nine. I think I mispronounce a lot of words. Um, I also remember taking notes on Nancy Drew novels to try to solve the mystery before the end. So that's a lot of background about me, but I, I've included it because I've had the image of a kaleidoscope in my head a lot recently, uh, how sometimes in life the kaleidoscope turns and all the pieces that were already there suddenly form kind of a new pattern. And I feel like that's what happened to me at this point in my life. What actually happened involves the introduction of a new character, uh, my boyfriend at the time, now husband, Robbie. Uh, when I was working on my law degree, he was working on a PhD in biology and his focus was on high alpine plants. And he'd spent much of the time that I was in the beginning of law school in China, studying rhododendrons on a mountain called Yulong Shuishan or Jade Dragon Snow Mountain. So bear with me for a moment. I'm going to, uh, we've come to the slideshow portion of the presentation. I'm going to share my screen and enter the mountain mists on the shoulder of Jade Dragon Snow Mountain. So, when it became clear that his studies were going to keep Robbie in China for the next four years or so, I decided to spend that summer after my second year of law school in China. Uh, the plan was I would study Mandarin for a month in Kunming, which is the closest big city to his, his field site, and I'd spend the next month with him in the mountains. 
So Kunming is the capital of Yunnan province, which is in far southwest China. Yunnan kind of connects the, the humid jungles of Southeast Asia, Burma and Vietnam to the, the foothills of the Himalayas. And running through this province is a network of old trade routes between China and Tibet that was known as the Tea Horse Road. And because we're going to be traveling to the early 1700s in a few minutes, I've chosen a map from that period for my, uh, my geographical illustration of where I was. Uh, this, this is a map that was drawn, uh, I think in the 1750s, based on information in letters that were written by Jesuit missionaries in China. So you can see that uh, Northwest Yunnan, where the arrow is pointing, is pretty much as far as you can get from Beijing, China's capital, uh, in the, where the line starts, um, and still be in China. And beyond these colorful outlines are the mountains of Tibet. So zooming in on just the province of Yunnan itself, you can see from the perspective of the Jesuits making the map, this area is very much an edge, a final outpost within China before you get into the, the Terre des Lama, the land of the Lamas, the Tibetan areas about what, which the Jesuits knew very little. So Kunming would have been considered a relatively small rural city in the 18th century. And it's still thought of that way today, but uh, China is a very big place. And this small rural city has a population several times that of Chicago. So I was pretty overwhelmed when I arrived in Kunming, Kunming that summer with Robbie and his thesis advisor. They immediately left to go into the field, which was an eight hour train ride away into the mountains. And I will never forget watching their taxi drive away, leaving me standing alone outside the Cherry Blossom Hotel. I had been in China for a total of 12 hours. I spoke no Mandarin. I had a stack of index cards with messages written on them so I could hold up cards saying, which way to the Cherry Blossom Hotel or where can I buy food or <laughs> who am I and what am I doing here? Um, but I did find an apartment to share with an Australian woman named Jane and a rabbit named Villette. Um, I, I actually gave the rabbit that name because I was carrying a copy of Charlotte Bronte's novel Villette and the rabbit ate most of it, so it seemed appropriate. Um, but I enrolled in a language class at the local university and a month later, I used my new language skills to buy a ticket on the overnight train to Lijiang which is the city at the base of Jade Dragon Snow Mountain and the, to join Robbie there for the rest of the summer. So Lijiang, which in, in the books that I ended up writing, I refer to by its older name, which is Dayan, is a unique place. Historically, it's a market town, uh, a point on the Tea Horse Road. And as I said, or maybe I said, the, the Tea Horse Road is a trade route by which tea traveled from the forests of Yunnan, where it was grown, to the arid Tibetan plateau, where it could not, where it can't grow and is, for that reason, very highly valued. In 1996, Lijiang was almost completely destroyed by an earthquake. And at that time, most of it had the look of a modern contemporary city. But after the earthquake, the decision was made to reconstruct Lijiang's old town in a traditional style. So it is now a UNESCO World Heritage Site and a major tourist destination. So when I walked through these cobbled alleys early in the morning, this is me with my, my mother who came to visit, um, I could imagine that I had traveled back in time 400 years. So while we were there, we, Robbie and I spent half of our time in an efficiency apartment in Lijiang from which we could see the mountain, Jade Dragon Mountain itself, um, at least when it wasn't monsoon season, which meant a torrential downpour for two months. And the other half of our time we spent in a field station on the side of the mountain itself. And the altitude at the field station is uh, 3,200 meters which is about twice as high as the mile high city of Denver, Colorado. And I learned that different people respond differently to altitude. For me, it was a little bit hard to sleep. So at night on the mountain, I would listen to BBC radio dramas adapted from Agatha Christie mystery novels. I knew all the stories from the books and I found it so relaxing just to listen to them with you know, the added radio sounds of like train whistles and footsteps and clinking silverware. Um, so one day 
it's all coming together that summer. I was sitting on the mountain in a patch of rhododendrons with a field notebook, and I was feeling tired from hiking and loopy from the altitude and looking at these paths you can see crossing the mountain meadows, thinking about these old trade routes between China and Tibet. And I started to wonder if it would be possible to set a mystery on a trade caravan following the same narrative formula as Murder on the Orient Express. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. It's a mystery by Agatha Christie that takes place entirely on a train stuck in a snowdrift. And I, I wondered idly if a, a caravan isolated amid the mountain peaks could be as contained a setting as a, as a train if you were talking about just structuring a mystery plot. So at first the idea was just a thought experiment. It was something to think about during long hikes to field sites. Uh, but then when I traveled through Beijing on the way back to the US to finish law school, um, I visited the ancient astronomical observatory there. And I'll talk about that more in a minute, but the result of that visit was that I learned about the Jesuits who were in China at the end of the 17th and the start of the 18th century. And I saw a way to bring them into this, this story that was taking shape in my mind. So at the end of the summer, that summer, I started researching and writing and I kept going when I returned to St. Louis for my final year of law school. So when I wasn't preparing for class or spending time with a few really good friends, I was in the university library reading about the Tea Horse Road, poisonous plants, the English East India Company, Jesuit missionaries, and the reign of the Kangxi Emperor. Or I was in my apartment sketching out diagrams of caravan campsites and writing scenes. Um, so over that year, I selected a murder victim and introduced about 20 suspects, maybe 14 red herrings, eight different settings, several complicated subplots. So as I mentioned, I'd never written fiction before and it took me a whole year to realize that what I was doing was not going to work. Um, I had a manuscript that lengthwise represented about half of a complete book, but I realized that it was so overstuffed with ideas and plot, there was no way to bring it all to a conclusion in my lifetime. <laughs> Um, so this was my first big lesson about writing. I, I hadn't realized how much space it takes to see an idea through, to see a character through, to create a setting. Um, I learned that there isn't nearly as much space in a book as I thought there would be. But by the time I reached this realization, I had graduated from law school and returned to Lijiang with the intention of staying there at least two years. And I thought about abandoning the book, uh, but I had, I had something someone really, I should say, who wouldn't let me do it. And, and that was a protagonist, Li Du. So the character of Li Du first occurred to me like, like the book itself on the mountain. Really, I, I think I can trace it to a specific moment. Robbie was off somewhere out of sight, you know, on a cliff tying pink flagging tape to rhododendrons like he does. Um, and I was sitting I was sitting at the top of a gorge, if you can picture, that had a view of the steep slope on the other side of the gorge. And I, as I watched this cloud entered the bottom of the gorge below me, kind of snaking through it. And then the cloud expanded. So it rose up and filled the whole gorge, kind of like steam in a cauldron. And then suddenly it engulfed me too. So all I could see was white. And the cloud was, was shifting, and as it shifted, these windows would open up. So I could see framed by the cloud just one tree or one boulder on the gorge on the other side of me before the cloud would close again. And I had this strong sense of shifting time. I, I kept expecting to see someone through one of those windows, but someone not living in my dimension, really. Um, again, I think that lowered inhibitions caused by high altitude lack of oxygen really helped turn me into a writer. Um, so I had that moment. And then I had been reading about an 18th century scholar named Xu Shaku, who liked to travel through China with guidebooks and correct them when he found mistakes, things that were inaccurate. He was grumpy and wonderful. Um, I'd also read about exile as punishment. So between this research and my sense that there was someone in the mist on the mountain, I came up with the character of Li Du. And Li Du is a librarian, and that he is a librarian is something he sort of 
declared to me. Uh, librarians are such powerful characters in fiction. Um, I'm thinking for me in particular, the, the father in Something Wicked This Way Comes by Ray Bradbury or Jorge in the Name of the Rose by Umberto Eco, both of which are big influences. Um, I was writing an early piece of dialogue when Li Du introduces himself to another character. And at the time I didn't have a profession for him, but I, I typed I am in his words at a finish a librarian. So it was one of those nice rare moments when a character really just tells you something about him or herself. Li Du is also a traveler far from home. And this was a really important way for me to relate to him across time and culture. Um, for a librarian from Beijing at that time, Yunnan would have felt like a foreign country with unrecognizable languages and customs. So to a limited extent, I could give Li Du my own sense of being a traveler in an unfamiliar place. And thinking back on it now, after some time, I, I think it did go deeper than that. I, I think I related to Li Du more even than I realized. Um, I was a recent law school graduate without a clear sense of what I was gonna do with my degree sort of uncertain about my choice um, not to take the bar exam. And Li Du uh, had been on a track to become a magistrate and had become a librarian instead. And now he was this, this traveler far from home, uncertain of his place in the world. And I think writers do always end up in their characters. And by this time, Li Du felt real to me. So I wanted to see where his story went and maybe thinking back on it now a little bit because I didn't know where mine was going to go. And, and as, as it ended up, the two stories really ended up joining because in a way, Li Du was my future and, and I was his. So, so I relied on Li Du and the mountain mists and I tried again. I simplified the plot. I set aside the historical research that wasn't relevant to the story I was telling. And I, I started from the beginning. Um, and even though a lot of research did go into the book, when I look back at it now, I see that everything that was there on that day that I first thought of Li Du ended up in the completed manuscript. You know, I was there fractured through the book. Uh, Li Du was there, the Southern peaks of Yulong Mountain were there and the town at its base. Agatha Christie was present in the classical mystery conventions that I chose to structure the story. Uh, Robbie made it in as a lost botanist and an unconvincing murder suspect and even, even that cloud was there offering this method of transport from my own time to the 18th century and, and surrounding Li Du in a scene, a moment when he has to decide whether to renew his commitment to solitude or open his heart to friendship and, and stay in town until the mystery is solved. So the cloud even had a role. And that is how Jade Dragon Mountain came to be. I'd like to take just a short time now to go a little bit deeper into the historical context for the events in the book. So even though my books are entirely fictional, I did rely on historical research to construct really the, the underlying motivations in Jade Dragon Mountain and its sequels. Uh, so the story is set in the year, oh, sorry, I missed the Shushaka side slide. I'll leave that up for a moment. Um, <laughs> The story is set in the year 1708. And as a reference point on that, Benjamin Franklin was two years old. So toddler Benjamin Franklin, another 68 years to go before he would be working on drafting the Declaration of Independence. Benjamin Franklin does not appear in the book for those of you who haven't read it. Um, but in China, 1708 was not long after the start of a new dynasty, the Qing dynasty. And it would be long, but it would prove to be China's last. When it ended in 1911 with the Chinese Revolution, that was the end of thousands of years of imperial China. But in 1708, it was really just getting started. Uh, this new dynasty was founded by horsemen from the north beyond China's border who were called the Manchu. And they came to China, took Beijing, overthrew the ruling family, and declared themselves the new rulers and they, they called their dynasty Qing. So the emperor of China in 1708 was only the second Qing emperor to rule and he was called the Kangxi emperor. And the Qing, even though they were an invading power, they 
kept the traditions and the bureaucracy of their predecessors, the Ming, mostly intact. So in many ways, Kangxi was working hard to learn this ancient system that he had inherited and to legitimize himself in the eyes of the people his family had conquered. So one of the ways that he was doing that was by using technology brought by Jesuit missionaries. In the West at this time, there was a growing interest in China and a demand for its goods, most notably its tea and its porcelain. But the English East India Company, which was very early days for it, um, didn't really have anything that China wanted in return. So China's borders were essentially closed to Westerners uh, with a few exceptions. And one of those was the Jesuits. They were allowed into China. They had first come to the imperial court during the previous dynasty, the Ming, about a hundred years earlier. And so the Kangxi had inherited them sort of as well. <laughs> And he found them really useful. Um, in particular, their knowledge of astronomy helped him make more accurate predictions of events like solar eclipses, which is really important in the book. Um, and this, this contributed to this effort that he was making to establish his authority. So I learned about the Jesuits when I visited the ancient astronomical observatory, which still stands in Beijing. It's a fortress-like building, kind of a square tower, and it's one of the few remaining remnants of the, the old inner city walls. So in this 1736 illustration, you can see the instruments that were built for the Chinese emperor with the help of the Jesuits in his court. And the instruments can still be seen today, uh, although now they are replicas of the originals and surrounded by very clear indications of the modern world, including this tangle of highways around the observatory that actually makes it quite difficult to, to get to just safety wise. Um, so the Kangxi emperor liked the Jesuits, he got along with them, but things didn't stay stable. And in 1708, the situation was changing. There was infighting in the Catholic church. The Pope thought that the Jesuits weren't converting enough Chinese people and worried that they were acclimating a little bit too much to Chinese culture. And as I said, Kangxi liked the Jesuits, but he was starting to be kind of over the drama um, and things started to get tense. And at one point, right around 1708, a letter from the Pope arrived in Beijing and it said that if the Jesuits didn't reform, he would call them back to Rome. And Kangxi didn't like the authoritative tone being taken by this Pope off somewhere in the West. Um, and Kangxi was reported to have replied the Jesuits are my subjects now. If the Pope wants them reformed, I'll send them back in a different form. I'll send them without their heads. So plenty of motives for murder to find in that history. And I had such a good time spinning, spinning them into a story. So I wrote two more adventures for Lidu after that, the, the White Mirror and City of Ink. You remember that stuck in a snowdrift idea? Uh, it came back. The White Mirror was inspired by botanical field work that was conducted higher in the mountains in the, the culturally Tibetan area of Dachin. And this work was a, a collaboration with Chinese botanists that is part of a, a global collaboration called Gloria. Basically teams of botanists all over the world set up sites on mountain summits and return to them every five years to record how the plants have changed. And I've been so fortunate to be able to uh, join several of these expeditions now uh, in China and, and Nepal, though of course they're on, on hold for a little while at the moment. So the Southwest China summits are located on that old network of trade routes I talked about earlier, the Tea Horse Road. And I should reiterate here the importance of that trade route. So tea from Yunnan is used to make, uh, in Tibet, to make yak butter tea. And I don't know if anyone's tried it. I'd love to hear in the comments if you, or questions if you have. Uh, it's pretty much what it sounds like. You take yak butter, which is a sort of, has a sort of cheesy, musky, yaki taste, and you churn it together with strong tea and a lot of salt. And it's hard to overemphasize how important this is. This makes up the majority of the traditional diet for most of the people in the Tibetan region. And the early roots that brought tea from Southwest China to Tibet 
were of vital economic importance. And it's really, it's been likened to the Silk Road. So these, these botanical expeditions in the area included a team of about 10 people. We would drive as far as we could until the winding mountain roads became impossible to navigate. And then we'd hire local guides and mules and trek several days away from the roads, deeper into the mountains, crossing passes and skirting gorges. And we'd set up campsites and every day we'd, we'd hike up to the summits and take data. So the valley in which the White Mirror, the book is set, is a, a composite of several of these campsites. And I had never done anything like this before in my life. It was very cold and difficult. Really every morning we were sort of unsticking ourselves from the frozen ground and thank goodness for yak butter tea because it is just incredible for getting you going in the morning. Um, but a few times up on those summits, we did get caught in the snow and you know, it, it starts and you try to keep working, blowing on your fingers and brushing the snow off plants and off the paper you're trying to take notes on. And then suddenly everything goes white and the wind picks up and the umbrellas turn inside out. And you realize that these steep shifting rocks that you climbed up to get there are now just this white drop that you have to get down. Uh, so back in the herders uh, cabin in the evenings, we'd all gather around the fire and try to warm up without melting the soles of our boots. And we pressed plants by firelight and drank hard barley alcohol and listened to our team leader recite poetry. And uh, on some nights he drank enough to move from Chinese poetry to Simon and Garfunkel songs, which was always very special. So that was what I drew on when I was writing The White Mirror. It's in, in The White Mirror, Li Du is traveling with one of these trade caravans on the T-horse road when a snowstorm traps them in an isolated manner and nearby a man has just been found dead in the snow. So to solve the mystery, Li Du has to confront a few demons from his past and the result of that confrontation leads him inevitably back home to Beijing and to further adventures in the third book, City of Ink. So it's close to time to move on to questions, but I wanted to conclude with a word on my most recent book, uh, The Cabinets of Barnaby Main. I will stop the screen share, there we go. And so something I didn't know before I started writing books is that by the time you finish writing one, you've created a lot of ghosts. So there are these ghosts of characters who didn't end up finding a place in the story or ghosts of plot points that had to be deleted. And The Cabinets of Barnaby Main started with one of those ghosts in Jade Dragon Mountain, I modeled one of the characters on a man named James Cunningham, who was a, a Scottish ship surgeon who tried to go to China, maybe did in 1696. And when he announced that he was going to do it, uh, it was a big deal because very, as I said, very few Westerners were going to China at that point. He received instructions from a London apothecary on how to collect and preserve plants to bring back to England. So those of you have, who have read Jade Dragon Mountain will know the character of Hugh Ashton. Uh, his background a, uh, as a botanist didn't, up, end, didn't end up playing as big a role as I thought it would. So I had done a lot of research that I, that I hadn't used and I learned a little bit about this community of collectors who were waiting in England for items like Cunningham's pressed plants. And I always wanted to follow those plants from China back to England and enter this, this community of collectors. So for my fourth book, that's what I decided to do. And, and that's how I came to write The Cabinets of Barnaby Main in which a murder and a few other mysteries take place within this community and their cabinets um, and their collections. So in my research for cabinets, I came across a journal published in about 1750 by a Swedish traveler named Per Kalm, who visited England and toured one of these collections. And in this, this account written in 1750, Kalm communicates so clearly the feeling of visiting a museum and not having time to see everything. He's frustrated, disoriented, exhausted, overstimulated. And I, I saved and highlighted that detail in my notes because I knew it would be essential. And it, it really was because Calm's journal helped me build my fictional 18th century collection, 
But I also found something so relatable in, in its pages that kind of sang its truth to me across the centuries. You know, most museum visitors know what it's like to get to the end of the day with your brain full and your heels blistered and you're already not sure what you saw and what you learned. And I know it's happened to me. So recognizing my own experience in Calm's descriptions kind of freed me to draw on my own memories as I was crafting scenes for 18th century characters. And I gained something else from Calm's journal, which was a, a good mystery mechanic, because as I thought about visitors touring a collection and being kind of disoriented by the dense displays, I thought about how difficult it would be for them to recall the order of events on the day. So the voice of Agatha Christie in my head suggested this might be a very happy circumstance for a murderer. So my approach to historical fiction has become very much a back and forth between historical research and my own reality. I, I look to historical research for inspiration and detail, but then I look to my own reality for, for honesty and contemporary relevance. And I think my goal in the end with each book is to create a, whole, a separate world, its own world built to hold that one story that I'm telling. Um, and the results of this process are, I hope, stories that don't necessarily teach a lot of history, but do, do offer some insights into the ways that that storytelling and relationships and desires and fears make us human um, as much now as they did in the past. So thank you so much for listening. Uh, Karen, over to you. I'm happy to take questions. Uh, what a fascinating journey you had. Mm -hmm. um, I, as you were talking about your um, connection to, are you there? There you are. Oh, as you were talking about your connection to um, Agatha Christie's Murder on the Orient Express, I said, oh, this is the white mirror. Right. <laughs> and then you said that, that it was. Um, so yeah, it was, it was fascinating. Um, uh, Karen Manuel says she recently read The City of Ink. Was there really a city constructed like that city? Walls, gates, et cetera, Dead, deadlines, I don't know. Yes, so the, in the city of ink, which, which takes Li Du back to, to Beijing, uh, it, is, it is absolutely based on research about uh, into what Beijing would have looked like um, in that time. You know, uh, the city has, its history is not as visible in its architecture now as it is for some for some other cities. It's it's hard to find, but but it is possible. And uh, so it was a city of walls, a wall. You know, we, you think of China and we think of of the Great Wall, but but Beijing had outer walls and inner walls and walls around neighborhoods, all of which were very carefully monitored because uh, the Qing were concerned about uh, people congregating, about possible rebellion by supporters of the Ming. So it was this very regulated walled city. And I, I loved learning about that and, and turning that, thinking about that in terms of mystery mechanics as well. And, and the last thing I'll say, I had a wonderful time researching it because I was able to find an old map of Beijing and overlay it onto Google Maps and walk the routes that I wanted to have my characters walk, even though I had to use my imagination to put the buildings back that weren't there anymore. But it did, um, it did work out well, and I felt it, it became as real to me as, as it could. Right. I, it struck me how remarkable it was that the um, Jiang, is that the modern city where Dian was? Li Zhang, yes. Li Zhang. Um, it, how remarkable that they decided to rebuild it as it was. Um, usually that doesn't happen. Um, it really was, yeah, and incre incredible and, and such a privilege to spend time there. Right, absolutely. You've made me want to go there. <laughs> um, let's see, Anna says that she has had yak butter tea in Tibet. She thought it was horrible. <laughs> And I usually almost all, and I usually like almost everything. <laughs> it, it does sound a little gamey. 
I do think I, I, when I think about it, I think I would never ever want to drink it during a, a summer in St. Louis. Um, but, but in the context of, of being so, so tired and cold, uh, I, I was definitely grateful for it in the moment, but, but gave me yes. <laughs> um, Martha says, thank you so much for showing us these beautiful slides and scenery. What a treat while being in isolation. I can't wait to read your books. Thank you. Um, Karen Butter says, you talk about lingering characters. You actually talk about ghosts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, she said, is there another book that needs to be written? It's many, I think. <laughs> They're all, all those, um, those plot points that, that uh, the overabundance of plot points from those original ideas. But yes, I, I keep a, a running notebook of all the, all the bits that, that turn into ghosts uh, and, and, and both for Lee Dew's books and for, and for Cecily Kay, this, this new detective uh, who does, I do have another adventure uh, plotted out for her. Um, in which some of the, the ghosts from Barnaby, Maine do, do appear. So I, I like thinking of it that way. Good, I'm looking forward to that. Um, Lee Knight, um, my husband and I went to Li Zhang and Jade Dragon Mountain oh. in 2004. We had the yak butter tea. We stayed in the old city. You found your description, your description of Li Zhang brought back many fond memories. Now we will read your books. Oh, I'm so glad. I, I, I am grateful for the opportunity to think back to Jade Dragon Mountain because I really enjoyed I really enjoyed returning to these memories over the, the past couple of days preparing. Right. I have a good friend who um, spent some time in Korea and is very interested in, um, in Asian history. And she just has fallen in love with your books. Oh, good. <laughs> um, that's so great to hear. Thank you. Um, I love your characters, says Carol, um, and I miss them. What um, will you write more mysteries with Lee Du and um, Hamza? It's a, a question I've received before, and I, I would love to. I, I don't have any, you know, deadlines are exactly scheduled right now, but I do, I do have more ideas and more places that. Uh, that I would like to take them to traveling both within China and, and maybe outside of it as well. So mm -hmm. um, thank you. I, 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 I love the idea that people would want to read more and, and I would love to spend more time with, with Li Du and Hamza. Will you be spending more time in China in the future? I hope so. Once, you know, once things go, I hope go back to normal right. and, and, and we're traveling again. I, mm -hmm. uh, my, my husband now works at the Missouri Botanical Garden and, and is continuing his, his high alpine research. So in theory, we'll keep, we'll keep going to these, to these high mountain sites um, and, and, and counting flowers. <laughs> um, That's hardcore camping. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't quite know what I was getting into there, but yes. <laughs> Do you think you will stay with the genre of historical fiction mysteries? Are other stories bubbling up? That's a, 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 great, a great and timely question. Other stories are bubbling up, I think, maybe um, because of this year taking us all uniquely in our own ways to kind of different places in our minds and our imaginations. I, um, I have been thinking a little bit in other genres, maybe maybe uh, a little bit more towards fantasy with with a bit of historical fiction as well i've i've been giving my imagination free reign and exploring exploring other directions i don't know if they'll go anywhere but um but it's been a great comfort and pleasure to to have other worlds to go to sure um, Joe Winsonry says i'm reading the cabinets of barnaby maine and like the description the depiction of all the collections. Thank you. I found it so atmospheric. I felt like every time I walked in with you, your descriptions are wonderful. And I just could picture this whole thing. You walk in and it, it's dark because there's not much light in these places, candlelight. And you've got alligator things coming out at you and birds coming out and feathers drifting down and um, so many things coming out of the gloom. 
It really doing so all of the objects that I mentioned in cabinets of Barnaby Maine are drawn from actual catalogs of 18th century collectors uh, and with they they took these really careful notes and so uh, so I was able to select you know objects that were actually there and I actually had to restrain myself from being too weird in the ones that I selected because I thought no one would believe that that people actually you know went to the trouble of collecting you know a rat skeleton from their wall and and labeling it and displaying it but really they were interested in everything they wanted to kind of control the world by arranging arranging it on their shelves it felt like and it was this this great sort of arrogance of the time and, and ambition. And uh, yeah, I did find myself very much getting lost in those cabinets. Right. I love the character of Hamza. This is from Sophia. Um, are there stories he tells drawn from historical folktales or invented by you or both? A little bit of both. And um, I love Hamza too. My, my mother, when she read the first book was like, where does Hamza come from? Because like we do, it was obvious, you know, this shy librarian bookish type, but um, Hamza had a certain sort of sense of humor that I, I, I don't know where it came from, but I, I, I like him too. And the stories come from all over the place. Some of them are from uh, various traditional folklores that in my mind, the character might have encountered uh, as early as the 1700s. Uh, others are either from my own imagination or have their uh, their core in even, I think one is almost based on an Agatha Christie short story, The, the Companion. Yes, if you go back and read Jade Dragon Mountain, you might see a resemblance between uh, Hamza's second second story and, and The Companion by Agatha Christie. So all sorts of influences went, in, went into that from my own sort of reading and storytelling path. Well, I guess the murderer in, um, in Jade Mountain, Drake, Jade, Jade, Jade Dragon <laughs> Mountain, <laughs> I keep getting Jade Mountain Dragon. Um, I guess the murderer was listening to his stories too. Yes, yes. I uh, the way that Hamza's stories fit into the fit into the bigger story changed a lot as as I was writing, and I think changed throughout the the three books. But but they are they are relevant. Um. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that was kind of fun that mm -hmm. they were. Um, are your books offered on audio, and if so, do you read them? Uh, they are offered on, on audiobook, uh, I, I know available on, on Audible and I don't read them, thank, thank goodness, um, but the, the, uh, the readers do a wonderful job. But the, I think it's the David Show, the same reader for all three of the first, the first books and then a new reader for Cabinets and they are excellent. I feel, I feel so, so lucky to have, have such great performers kind of give life to the characters. So, so they are available, yes. So your characters, um, Cecily Kay and Meekin, is that how you say her name? Mm -hmm. Meekin? Um, they're going to go off to the Moors in Northern England or Western England? Northern England, so Northern. To, 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 yes, to Durham, which is uh, where Cecily's family estate is located. And so they are going to go and uh, response to a letter from the, the steward about mysterious events occurring in her ancestral home. And uh, Cecily's ne'er-do-well husband will, will make an appearance uh, in, in this book and will explore their, their fraught relationship a little bit more. He has a little gender um, uh, issues there with the two of them, I guess. That Cecily's Cecily and her husband don't have the uh, the the strongest relationship. Yes, um, right. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. Do you have an anticipated time for that one to be completed? I don't. As soon as I do, I will put it up on my on my website. At the mm -hmm. moment, just uh, plotting and outlining and trying not to take breaks to go too deep into other fantasy worlds. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you're. Your pictures were just beautiful of um, China, just beautiful. Thank you and so those much. Those are steep. Somebody said that, um, Karen Manuel, I think. Those are really steep mountains you were climbing. 
<laughs> they were there. I mean, never a point where we had to use, you know, climbing equipment or anything, but, uh, but definitely the, the toughest hiking I've, I've ever done. Um, and, and at altitude too, which I, 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 I'm lucky that I didn't experience any more severe symptoms, but, um, but it does make it harder. Um, my problem when I get at altitude, I just go to sleep. I wouldn't be able to create. You did amazing <laughs> things. <laughs> Yeah, well, ending up being being uh, the opposite uh, for me, the sort of racing brain. But those, um, but those Agatha Christie mysteries, they're they're so good, <laughs> and they're still on radio. Yeah, I I I think those are available. Sort of, like, you can get all of them together now, sort of on Audible collections, the the older ones, and and there's been such a as always, again and again, resurgence of interest in Agatha Christie with these newer newer films that are coming out now, um, revisiting the stories. Right. Mm -hmm. Is that trade route still going? I mean, not not as as it would have been, you know. Right. You right. Take horses and um, uh, caravan trading, uh, but, but tea is certainly still, still grown in, in the forests of, of Yunnan and, and exported, you know, all over the world. Uh, I didn't talk about the specific, but Puar tea is, is, uh, sort of a delicacy that is enjoyed there. And it's a tea that is kind of ferment, allowed to ferment. So it has this complex flavor. And I read a lot about, you know, the people who really are, understand tea and, and apparently could, as this tea traveled and aged, it would take on some of the flavors and fragrances of the caravans or the kind of leather of the saddlebags and the sweat of the horses and the air of these different places um, on, in the mountains and that that would increase the, the experience and the value that when you drink the tea, you're almost taken on, if you're very sensitive to the, to the taste and the smell, you can be taken on this, this journey that the tea itself, the leaves have traveled because they've absorbed, uh, absorbed what, they've, what they've been through, which I, I really like as an image. You did a beautiful job of, um, when Lee Du teaches um, Hugh Ashton, who does he teach? I can't remember. Um, the ritual of tea and how to prepare tea properly. Um, I, in the first one, in the I first one. learning a little bit about that. I know so little, um, and I'm and I'm sure there are so um, many authoritative texts on on the subject. But the the little bit I was able to read and and experience there uh, myself, based on the generosity and hospitality of our hosts, was just such such a treat. Um, mm -hmm. Really, really appreciated it. Also, this was just really fascinating. Thank you so so much. Thank you so much for, for having me and- uh, yeah, We were thrilled. <laughs> well, I hope, I hope you have a, a wonderful rest of, of the evening and, and happy reading uh, through the rest of the year. I saw that you have uh, Robin Sloan, I think, coming on next. And I was really excited to see that because I loved um, Mr. Penumbra's 24 Hour Bookstore. So um, I, I, I know you'll enjoy that talk too. Yeah. Good, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, take care. Thank you, you too. Thank you all for attending our events. Thanks to Elsa for really a fascinating um, presentation. As Elsa said, we have another one coming up, another author presentation on February 17th with Robin Sloan. And um, he will be talking about his two books. His late, latest is um, Sourdough. And both of his books take place in the Bay Area. And then on the 24th, we have another art docent um, presentation with um, this one is Revelations Art from the Ameri um, African American South. Um, we have more events scheduled in March and in April. Please check our website and our Facebook page. And if you haven't signed up for our newsletter, please do. Please consider a donation to the Friends of the Alameda Free Library at alamedafriends.com. That will allow us to continue to sponsor events such as tonight's. Watch our website, newsletter, and Facebook page for additional events and to register for them. 
A special recognition to those who helped make this happen, David Beal, Karen Manuel, and Karen Butter. And a special thanks goes to Elsa Hart for a really outstanding talk. And of course, thank you all for joining us this evening. Have a good evening.